Kate, the last time that I saw you, you talked about how your worries have become a much bigger problem over the last few years and that's why you've come along to our clinic to see whether you might get some assistance for managing those worries. Would that be right? Yeah, definitely much bigger problem. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things I remember from what you told me last week was that these worries have really been around for quite a long time, for as long as you can remember. Yeah. Yeah, but that more recently it's really started to impact on things like your concentration with your studies and it sounds like it's also started to impact on relationships, is yeah. that correct? Yeah, I'm seeking a lot from my partner, kind of always checking in to make sure everything's okay. Mm, it sounds like it, it gets quite stressful then when you're interacting with him. Yeah, it can cause a lot of arguments yeah. and yeah, a lot of tension at home. Mm -hmm. I was hoping to take some time this session then to discuss some of the approaches that we might take to managing worry and how we might be able to relate to our thoughts in more effective ways. Is that something you'd like to do? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, okay, that's great. If we were to spend our time in session kind of looking at every thought that popped into your mind, so if this is you, and if every time you had a thought that kind of popped into your mind, we decided to focus on each one and try and solve each thought, how do you think we would go? I would take a really long time. Yeah, what makes you say that? I just have a lot of thoughts. Yeah, yeah. we do, right? And what we do tend to find is that um, we have thousands of thoughts each day. So if we were to sit here and look at each and every thought that came through, we would probably run out of time and you would be spending a lot of time just looking at your thoughts and not really living life. Yeah. It's not this initial thought that pops up that's a problem, but how we respond to that thought. Does this kind of worry spiral feel familiar to you? Yeah, definitely would call it a spiral, yeah. Yeah, okay. So the reason why we see that this initial thought is not so much the problem is because as I mentioned, we get thousands of thoughts a day. So understandably, some of them will be negative. And what we tend to find is because our minds are so busy um, and our brain is a natural threat detector, it does mean that it's gonna have a negative bias towards anxiety provoking thoughts. Mm -hmm. We might have worries about our relationships, worries about our studies, worries about our health, and just general day-to-day -day worries. So those negative thoughts are not avoidable. Another thing that we know is that we do experience stressful things in our lives. So these negative thoughts aren't that surprising. There will be some that will reflect the stresses or the difficulties that we experience. So as I mentioned, it's not so much the fact that these negative thoughts pop up that's the problem, it's how we respond to it. And what we tend to find is that there are two common ways in which we respond to these negative thoughts and can actually keep them going. The first is that we might pull it closer. So this is where we listen to those thoughts intently, we pay a lot of attention to them. Do you relate to pulling your thoughts closer when they pop up? Yeah, if they're important, definitely. I'll spend a lot of time thinking about them. Yeah, yeah. So some people might call them like dwelling on our thoughts or obsessing over our thoughts. Yeah. That's an example of how we might pull them closer. Yeah. The other way that we might relate to those thoughts is we might try and push them away. So this is what we call suppression and I can see you nodding already. Yeah. <laughs> what comes up to your mind when I describe that? Um, yeah, I do try to kind of like if I'm doing something, if I'm trying to study and the thoughts are popping in, I'm often kind of saying to myself, don't think about that. Like you can't think about that now. The stakes are too high. So yeah, yeah I try to push them away a lot because I just like, I'll get nothing done if I don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there, there sounds like a lot of kind of chatter in your head trying to push those thoughts away. Don't think about that. What do you notice happens when you tell your brain not to think about something? does it anyway. Yeah. yeah, okay. We often find that that kind of action is what we call thought suppression, mm -hmm. that it actually backfires on us and it sounds like it fits in with your experience. Uh, what we know about thought suppression, and this is through experience but also through research studies, is that when we try to push our thoughts away it actually creates what we call a rebound effect mm -hmm. in which those thoughts actually come back and often more intensely. Have you had that experience where it seems like the thoughts just come back more intensely the next time. Yeah, definitely, it can be really overwhelming. Yeah, absolutely. And that rebound effect is kind of feeling like that beach ball. Um, we talk a lot about a, a beach ball analogy. Have you tried to put, push a beach ball underwater before? Yeah, when I was a kid, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and how does that feel like when you try and push it underwater? Um, yeah, really kind of precarious, <laughs> like you're balancing on top of it. 
could fall at any time. Absolutely. So there's a lot of resistance that we feel and we feel yeah. like we have to constantly push it down, otherwise it will try and force itself up. And when you let go, what tends to happen? It hits me in the face. <laughs> yes, it does. It hits you with greater intensity. So our thoughts kind of perform like that beach ball. The more we try and push it away or the more we try and tell our brain to stop thinking about it, the stronger it kind of comes back. So when we try and pull the thoughts closer or push them away, that's when we find we get stuck in that pattern of repetitive negative thinking. And that's where the problem lies. So we'll expect that these negative thoughts might pop up from time to time. However, if we can respond differently to these thoughts instead of pushing or pulling, that might interrupt the process of worry. How is that sounding to you so far? I mean, yeah, if I could do it, that would be amazing. It would make a real difference if it's possible, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, it does mean that we will still have those negative thoughts mm -hmm. at the end of treatment. So those thoughts will still be popping up. The main difference will be that you are responding to them in a different way. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting caught up in them and listening to them intently, or instead of spending all that time trying to block them out of your mind in order to concentrate, um, that you might have an opportunity to be able to choose how to respond to them and mm -hmm. choose whether or not you want to attend to them at that point in time. How would that be for you? Yeah, if, if it works, it would be massive. Yeah, it would be a really big change. Okay, okay. Is that something that you would be willing for us to have more of a look at? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, okay. Now, if we were to try and change the way that we relate to our thoughts, we first need to understand why we end up in this push and pull cycle. Mm -hmm. So why it is that our worry keeps going. So one of the things that I'd like to look at with you for the remainder of this session is something that we call a worry flower, which tries to explain some of the reasons why we might push and pull our thoughts. Is that something you'd be willing to do? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'll draw this up on the whiteboard and I'd be really curious to hear which parts of this worry flower you relate to, mm -hmm. okay? okay? All right. So Kate, let's start with the initial thought. Just pop that down in the center of the flower here. When you came into the session today, did you notice any what if thoughts pop into your mind? Yeah, quite a lot of them actually. Yeah. Can you give me an example of one? Uh, what if you ask me like a question and I don't really know the answer to it. Okay, so I'll just write that down here. You can see my writing's really tiny here. <laughs> Again, it kind of fits in with the idea that the initial thought is not so much the problem, it's how we respond to it. Now, when that initial thought popped into your mind, did you notice any physical symptoms that came along with that? Um, yeah, probably my heart rate was probably a little bit up, mm -hmm. like heart beating really fast. Yes, so heart rate increased. What else? Um, maybe breathing a little bit quickly. Mm -hmm. Breathing rate increased as well. Mm -hmm. Any other symptoms that you noticed? Um, no, those were the main ones. Yeah. yeah, okay. So it sounded like your anxiety was starting to pick up in your body a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Let's have a look now at then some of the beliefs that we might hold that keep our worry going. So when you started worrying, and this is a little bit of a different way to think about it, because oftentimes when people come into our program, it's because worry is causing quite a few problems for them already. However, when you started worrying, did you notice why you did it, whether there were any advantages or gains that came along with your worry? Um, well, I mean, I sort of started thinking about what, what you might ask me and started sort of thinking through what I could say mm -hmm. and like trying to remember last session what we spoke about so that I could, yeah, sort of prevent that from happening. Ah, okay. So um, it sounds like it helps to keep you prepared yeah. for what might happen this session. Helps me prepared. And also it prevents negative situations from happening. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other positive things that you think come about when you worry about things? Um, I think those are the main ones. Um, yeah, it kind of prepares me emotionally. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if I can already think about the things that are going to go wrong, then I won't be as disappointed if it actually happens. Ah, okay. So it also kind of helps keep you prepared for the future as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now I know that you mentioned that besides worry, another thing that you might do is play back on past events, mm -hmm. something that we call rumination. Yeah. Are there any things that you're trying to get out of ruminating about past events? Yeah, to kind of understand things better, mm -hmm. okay. work out where something went wrong. Yeah. Helps me to understand things better. Kind of problem solve past mistakes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Now, if you held these beliefs, what we call positive beliefs, that your worry or your rumination was helpful, what do you think would happen to your worry? Would you do more of it or less of it? Or more, yeah. Yeah, if you thought that your worry was really helping you to be prepared to prevent negatives from happening and to help you understand things better and problem solve past mistakes, you're likely to worry more, yeah. wouldn't you? And that's gonna keep that repetitive negative thinking going. Now, when you think that your worry is helpful for you, where's your attention at when you're worrying? Yeah, on, on the thing I'm worried about, on the worry. Yeah, okay. So, let's note that down. Sounds like you focus on the worries. Mm -hmm. What else do you notice that your attention drifts to? Um, sometimes focus on myself, like how I'm physically feeling. Yeah, okay. Would that, would that be the physical yeah. symptoms? Self-focused, on sensations. And how much attention would you say that you're paying on the tasks that you're doing? Not much. Okay. So would it be fair to say not task focused then? No, definitely not. Yeah, okay. And that kind of highlights the concentration difficulties that you were telling me about. It's really hard to pay attention to something like your studies or trying to read something when your attention is really focused on those worries and the uncomfortable sensations. In terms of a time point, do you notice where your worries or your rumination tends to be focused on? Um, probably, yeah, in the future, like what mm -hmm. I'm worried about. Yeah, okay, so in the future. Does it ever go backwards into the past? Yeah, sometimes as well. Yeah, okay. if I think I've done something wrong or worried about something in the past, I'll think about that too. Yeah, okay. And if your worries are focused on the future or the past, where are you not at? not in the present. <laughs> yeah, it would be really hard to stay in the present moment, wouldn't it? Now, if we're not focused on the task and we're not focused on the present moment, what effect do you think that has on the worrying? Yeah, worry more, I guess. Yeah, it, it keeps us really, Exactly, it keeps us really stuck in our heads and that worry will keep intensifying. So one of the things that it does is keeps that worry going as well. Have you ever thought that your worry might be harmful or dangerous to you in any way? Um, yeah, sometimes I think I'm going to have a panic attack. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you might fear that the anxiety might really increase to the point you get panic attacks. Yeah. Okay. Now when I talk about the harm or danger it might cause, I'm talking about something a bit more extreme than anxiety or panic attacks because we know when thoughts pop up it does elicit that anxiety response and for some of us we might be more prone to these panic attacks. What I'm thinking about here are kind of more extreme physical or mental impacts that we might have. Are you worried that this worry or rumination that you're experiencing might have any physical impacts that might be dangerous or harmful to your body in any way? Oh yeah, in the long term, definitely. I feel like it's gonna kill me eventually. It's gonna give me a heart attack or something uh -huh. like that. Okay. Yeah, so I guess at its most extreme, you're kind of worried that it's really doing some permanent damage to your body. Yeah. And that it might increase your risk of a heart attack. Are there any other physical damage Kind of problems that you think might come along? Um, just all the things they talk about, you know, with stress, mm -hmm. you know, just really impacting your sleep and all of that, and that can, you know, cause cancer and things like that. Okay, 
cancer, it might increase your risk of cancer or even cause cancer. Yeah. Yeah. How about any mental impact? Are you concerned that your worry might have some long-term mental impact for you? Yeah, sometimes it feels like I'm just going to go crazy. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's actually a really common one. Um, not just in the long term, but even at the moment, people have described to me when they're really caught up in their worries and unable to kind of step away from it, it feels like they're going crazy, that they're going mad. Okay. Now, when you have these kinds of fears that come up for you, we call them danger beliefs. And if you start worrying and start thinking, I might have a heart attack, I might get cancer, I'm going crazy, what does that do to your anxiety? Oh, it gets way worse. Yeah, so your anxiety really shoots up. And what do you notice then happens in terms of how you try to respond to your thinking? I try not to think about it, try yeah. to stop worrying. Yeah. yeah, so we go back to that suppression that I talked about earlier, that beach ball effect. And we know that when we try and suppress, what's going to happen to those thoughts? Come back up. They're going to come back up. So these danger beliefs actually intensify that anxiety because it leads to suppression. It leads those thoughts to come back up with greater intensity as well. Now, if we did think that our worrying was that dangerous and that harmful to ourselves, why don't we just stop it or control it? It would be nice if I could. Yeah. 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 Do you feel that you can stop or control your worry? No, it's just out of control all the time. Ah, oh, right, okay. So if you could, you would, but it feels out of control. What else stops you from trying to control your worry? I mean, I do try sometimes, mm -hmm. but it just doesn't work. So yeah. okay. it's just always there. It's constantly, yeah. constantly going. So it's constant. It's always there. So it sounds like you've had many frustrated attempts of trying to control your worry. However, a lot of experiences that speak to it being uncontrollable for you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. We'll call these our uncontrollability beliefs. Now, if you hold these uncontrollable beliefs, when you start to worry and you think my worry is out of control, it's constant and always there, there's nothing I can do about it, what's that going to do to your anxiety? Yeah, it makes me feel way more anxious. Yeah, it kind of does the same thing as the danger believes yeah. it increases our anxiety. It then leads to that suppression yeah. and keeps those worries going as well. Do you notice then that there are certain things that you do to try and stop or control those worries, perhaps in less effective ways? I go on my phone all the time. Mm -hmm. Like I'll just kind of keep scrolling to try to, yeah, just get rid of the thoughts. Yeah, okay. So it sounds like use a bit of distraction. Yeah. Yeah. With your phone. Okay. And as you talked about, it's trying to get rid of your thoughts. So mm -hmm. that's thought suppression. Yeah. Yeah. What else do you notice that you do? Um, I sometimes take sort of medication to help me sleep or to make me feel less anxious. Medications, yeah. Related to medication, some people also say that they might drink or they might use drugs. Do either of those apply to you? Yeah, de like if I have a big sort of event that I have to go to, mm -hmm. I definitely wouldn't go unless I'm having, yeah, a couple of drinks. Or if I've just had a really big day mm -hmm. and I just can't stop the thoughts, yeah, I'll do yeah. that as well. Okay, okay. Are there any other things that you might do to try and stop or control your worrying? Just try to sleep a lot. Yeah, okay. And so it can often be a form of avoidance, trying yeah. to block out the worries entirely. Yeah. Are there other things that you notice that you avoid in order to try and reduce those worries or control those worries? Yeah, kind of avoid the things that I worry about sometimes. Mm -hmm. So if I'm really stressed about an event that's coming up, mm -hmm. I'll, you know, kind of avoid um, thinking about it might not even go or I'll try not to sort of look at things that are going to make me feel really anxious. Like I'll try not to read things that are going to make me feel anxious. Ah, yes, okay. So it might be avoiding situations. It might be avoiding certain activities. Okay. And what do you notice happens when you are able to avoid these situations in the short term? 
I feel better to start with. Yeah. yeah, we might kind of feel that sense of relief of not having to do something or those worries not intensifying as much as they do. Does that work for you in the long term? No, I guess I wouldn't be here if, if it did. Yeah, have you got an example in which avoidance has backfired for you? Um, I guess, yeah, sort of situations where I do skip events where I have to see certain people mm -hmm. and then I finally do have to go. I just feel mm -hmm. so much worse because I haven't seen everyone in such a long time. Ah. Everyone's like, why haven't you been coming along? And I feel really awkward. I don't really know what to do. Right. So it almost brings up more worries for you yeah. after not seeing them for a long time. Yeah. Okay. So in that example, you might initially feel relief being able to cancel on an event. Yeah. However, it sounds like those worries build up and the next time that you have to see them becomes more difficult and anxiety provoking. Would that be right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Now, Kate, I remembered earlier on, you also mentioned that reassurance seeking is something that you do a lot of. Yeah. Yeah. What does that look like for you? Um, like, I'll just kind of, like, ask my partner all the time if we're okay, if he's sort of still feeling the same way. Mm -hmm. And how does that feel like, kind of, when you reach out to him and he responds? Yeah, it feels better. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so occasionally you do feel better about it. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like there's almost a butt coming in there. Yeah. Yeah. He gets pretty annoyed at me sometimes. Ah, okay. So it sounds like it's causing some strain yeah. in those interactions with him if you yeah. seek too much reassurance. Yeah. 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 And one of the things we also notice is that when we start to seek reassurance, that maybe feels okay in the short term, that we might hear the other person's response and feel a bit relieved. However, Oftentimes our brains will start to then kind of doubt that feedback that we received yeah. and we might start to second guess. Do you relate to that at all? Yeah, definitely. Like I'll only usually feel better for sort of five, ten minutes and then something else pops up. Yeah, so the reassurance seeking might keep going, however, would not be successful in breaking that long-term kind of worry pattern. So we call this um, helpful behaviours. Petal. And I just noticed I didn't put a heading for this one here where we focus on what's happening for us internally on our worries. We call this one the unhelpful attention. Petal. Okay. So Kate, you might be able to see why we call this the worry flower. Yeah. <laughs> and based on what we discussed so far, were there any things that were surprising to you or that stood out to you? Um, I didn't realise that I had positive beliefs about it. I didn't think there was anything good about it. Yeah, that's often one of the most surprising elements for people who kind of look at their worry in this sort of um, model, mm. I suppose. It's that oftentimes we are coming into these sessions because we want to stop our worrying. However, there are quite a few beliefs that we're not aware of that operate out of our conscious awareness that mean that we do pull our worries closer together and that's our positive beliefs. So being able to increase our awareness of when those positive beliefs are activated can help us to then shift away from that urge to pull them closer as well. Now, the thing about how we respond then, if you find that these are some of the things that are keeping your worry going, is if we can help you to see your worrying as neither helpful, so we can kind of remove the pull of this petal, mm -hmm and not dangerous as well. And that you can react to these initial thoughts as just thoughts and that you can choose where you want to focus your attention on. You can bring it back to focus on the task at hand and engage in more helpful behaviours to respond to these thoughts more effectively. If you could do all of these things that I just mentioned, do you think your worry would be as much of a problem for you? Yeah, well, no, if I, if I could do all those things, it wouldn't be as much of a problem at all. Yeah, yeah. Ideally, what this treatment program kind of helps people to do is develop strategies for challenging some of the beliefs that we hold about our thinking. Mm -hmm. Helps us to strengthen our attention so that we can notice when we're getting hooked into those worries mm -hmm. and also reshift our attention to the task at hand and also develop more helpful problem-solving behaviours mm -hmm. so that we can respond to these situations in more effective ways. Then what we do tend to find is that we can change how we respond to our thinking. So I maintain that again, the initial thought will still be there. We will expect and accept that they do pop up. However, we would be responding to those thoughts in a different way so we're not falling back into this kind of spiral in which we get stuck with our worry and rumination. 
How does that sound to you as a plan for us to work on? Sounds like a really good one. If a, yeah, if it all worked for me, that would be amazing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's have a go then at starting to look at the uncontrollability beliefs to start with. Okay.